Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Right. Praise the Lord. Hello, family. Hello. Happy Family and Friends Day. Amen. 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 If I can hold your attention for just a few moments, there was a little boy. There was a little boy <laughs> who had listened to a sermon, a quite lengthy sermon, and he got a little antsy and started to act out in church. So his dad took him out into the lobby to have a little talk to him. And the little boy said, well, I just don't understand what's going on, why he talks so long. <laughs> and the dad said, well, the pastor does a lot of other things. He does more than just talk to the congregation. Throughout the week, he goes to visit the sick. He prays for people. He talks to people even more. He does a whole lot during the course of the week. Can I have another mic? He does a whole lot during the course of the week. All right, can you hear me? So the pastor does a whole lot of things throughout the course of the week. He doesn't just preach on Sundays. And it's not so easy being a pastor. So the little boy said, well, ain't so easy listening. <laughs> so if I can have your attention for, uh, for the next few minutes, we will honor God and what's going to be brought forth. I thank God for you being here today. It is a privilege to, to even um, have the opportunity to share God's word. I take it very seriously. And... Um, I'm nervous today, and I'm not sure how come, but that's, that's, I mean, nervous is good because it shows humility. But today, I'm just really shaking in my boots. But I want to thank um, husband, pastor, Kendrick, for um, allowing me this opportunity. I wish I had known you sooner so I could love you longer. Everybody, family, friends, hello, everybody. Before I get started, we need to do a road check. A road check is important because sometimes we come in, we have been out throughout the course of the week, and we get a little contaminated, and we come in with certain spirits on us. And so for the word to be brought forth and to saturate in your spirit, we got to shake it off a little bit. All right, so whoever you're sitting next to, it doesn't matter. You're going to go to the next neighbor. Just tell them, neighbor, shake it off. Jesus is here. The presence of the Lord is here. Amen. The presence of the Lord is here. So this month we're doing um, evangelism. Our pastor's going through the five E's. And this month has been the month of evangelism, so I am going to be talking about evangelism as it relates to this particular scripture of passage. So it is our custom to stand doing the reading of God's word. If you are physically able, please stand for the reading of God's word. And I will be reading from Luke 14, Luke chapter 14, and I will be starting at verse 15 with emphasis on verses 17, 21, and 23. Are we there yet? Amen. Luke chapter 14, starting with verse 15, and I am reading from the NIV version. So sometimes I might vacillate between dinner, banquet, but it's all meaning the same thing as it relates to this passage of scripture. The parable of the great banquet, verse 15. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a, a great banquet 
and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I ain't coming. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Dear Lord, we thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you, Lord, for waking us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for a brand new day of mercy. This is a day we have never seen, and it is a day that we will never see again. So, God, we pray that we will make this day count, that our light will shine even in the midst of darkness. And, God, I pray that someone will want to know what must they do to be saved. God, we love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. There were so many angles you could take this message in, but as it relates to evangelism, my focus scriptures would be on verses 17, 21, and 23. And he sent his servant. The title of this message is, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? There once was a man who was deeply moved by the pastor's sermon on evangelism one Sunday. So before he left the church, he decided to pray this particular prayer. Lord, if you want me to witness to someone today, please give me a sign and let me know who it is. And he did. So one day the following week, he was walking through the city park sitting on a bench. And a big, rough-looking guy came and sat towards him. The guy didn't look too pleasing to the eye. It looked kind of scary, to be honest with you. But he sat right next to the guy who had prayed that prayer earlier. And the guy was crying and weeping. And the guy who had prayed the prayer decided to get up and leave because he felt a little frightened because the man was so close to him, crying. And the man who was crying just grabbed him and said, Please, mister, please tell me, what must I do to be saved? The man who prayed the prayer at that moment got on his knees and said, Lord, is this a sign? <laughs> the Great Commission has become the great omission in a lot of congregations. What kind of firefighter would I be if I didn't warn you about fire? What kind of police officer would I be if I didn't tell you about criminals? What kind of doctor would I be if I didn't tell you about diseases? What kind of Christian would I be if I didn't warn you about hell? What would you say to a firefighter who saw your house burning down and all he or she said is, it'll burn itself out in a little while. <laughs> what would you say to a police officer who saw juveniles vandalizing property and simply said, well, you know what? Boys will be boys. What would you say to a doctor 
who when telling you that you had cancer, simply said, take two aspirins and call me in the morning. <laughs> what would you say to me, Evelyn, a Christian, who would not tell you about Jesus Christ and the love that he has for all of us? What kind of Christian would I be? You would probably think that I wouldn't be taking my Christian, my Christian walk as seriously as I should. Church, we have work to do. Yes. We have work to do. So in this parable that you find in Luke 14, Jesus is teaching a lesson on servanthood. So if you look at, look, look at me, not look at me, look at me, don't look at me. If you look in verses 15 and 16, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. So here's a little backdrop. Jesus is having dinner with, at the Pharisee's house. Not sure if they were trying to set Jesus up, but in the previous scriptures, if you start at verse 1, please read it at your leisure so you can kind of get a, a better understanding. Uh, Jesus is there at the Pharisee's house, but there is a man there with a disease called dropsy. And it's a disease that makes your body swell up real bad. And so they have him there, but you're not, they're not quite sure. Jesus is not quite sure if, if the man is there for a plant, if it's a setup, because Jesus will heal you. And if he sees you there, he's going to heal you. He's going to take care of business. But Jesus is there at the Pharisee's house, and they're just watching Jesus, just really, really checking him out. And Jesus is telling the story. You know, if you invite, and invite, if you invite someone to your, to your house, Chances are they're going to invite you back. You know, you do for me, I do for you. But if you invite somebody who can't pay you back, that's what the blessing really is. So Jesus is telling the story, so that's what's really going on. And then this man yells out, blessed is he who gets into the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, well, hold on, wait a minute. You're right, it is a blessing. But all, those who are not all of those who get an invitation don't really come. So that's what's really going on. So if you look at, so that's, a, that's in verse 15 and 16. Many guests were invited. So the, what, this mic is kind of bothering me. Where's the little tube thing? Because I, I, I'm a hand person. I use my hand and I just feel so restricted. Where's the little uh, capel, dumbbell? What? Something? What's it called? Where's the little lapel? Where's the lapel? George? Okay, it's gone. Can y'all hear me without the mic? No? Okay. All right. So, so, so many guests were invited to the party, and the inv invitation went out well in advance. You knew that this great dinner had been planned, so it's best to just clear your calendar. You don't always, you don't know the time. The invitations went out with the date on it, but not the time. So that's why the servant goes out to let them know the table is ready. Amen. The food has been prepared. So, when he, so the invitations are out. A lot of preparation has gone into planning this dinner. Let's try this again. Let's try this. Can you hear me? Yes. Woo! I'm free! Now, okay, here we go now, okay. The invitations have gone out well in advance. Beautiful invitations, nothing but the best. Embossed in gold letters. I can see the invitations reading, Oh, come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Come hungry, come thirsty, come and drink from the fountain of life. Come and eat the bread of life. Don't eat anything until you get here. Just come on in. So the servant is out, and the servant tells them, the table is ready. 
this ain't no potluck kind of meal. It's no paper plates, no paper cups. Because if you come to my house, you're eating from a paper plate. The finest china, dinnerware, fancy napkins, you know, that you kind of do this with, teacups, nothing but the best. Turkey dressing, yam, filet mignon, real by steak, potato salad, rutabaga, <laughs> oxtail, shrimp, fish, every collard green, mustard green, turnip green, cabbage, everything. The hot water, cornbread, yeast rolls. Are we hungry yet? This is the best. How can you possibly turn down that meal? Why would you turn down that meal and go get a McDonald's Happy Meal? Why would you do that? Because everything is at the table. Fruit, vegetables, something for everybody. The young, the old, the rich, the poor, there is something at that table for everybody. But they made excuses. Guess what the excuses were? In verse 18, the first one says, well, I just bought a field. I got to go see it. Lies you tell. <laughs> Chances are the dinner party was in the evening. So can you really see a field at night? I know they have these new uh, deer tractors nowadays with the big lights on them, but come on, really? Can you really see the field at night, right? So he was putting work before God. Verse 19, this fella says, well, I just bought five yoke of oxen. A yoke is a pair, so you have to team those, you have to team them up, and so you're not going to, purchase them without making sure they can work together because they have to pull and work together. It's kind of like buying a car before you test drive it. Come on, really? Did you not test that out before you bought it? He says, please have me excused. So he's putting material possessions before God. Verse 20, now he just got married. I ain't coming. You know how the missus is. You don't like me gone a long time. Bring your wife with you, man. <laughs> but in that day, the host would not schedule a dinner banquet if there was a big wedding going on because they were both considered big events. So chances are the man just didn't want to come for whatever reason. They all had this procrastinating, making excuse spirit. We do it too. Y'all know we do it too. God has spoken something to us, and we haven't responded yet. And we say we're going to do it, and we don't. And God is patiently waiting for our response. Please reply. I remember... When I was in my early 20s, I had gotten cable, and I couldn't afford cable, but they had, a, they had a special going on. And I got cable. I've always gone to church on Sunday, looked forward to church every Sunday, but this Sunday I said, I'm not going to church because I got cable now. <laughs> I watch HBO. I watch Pumpkinhead. Um, what's, that, what's that movie, uh, The Guy with the Claws? It was like, it was Freddy yeah, Cougar. Fred Cougar, it was like horror flicks Sunday. <laughs> but I did. So whatever the excuse might be, we all tend to do what we want to do. We do what we want to do with our time, and we do what we want to do with our money. But think about those guests and think about us. Those guests could have come if they wanted to, I believe they just weren't hungry. Amen. Many appetites have been ruined by something someone has seen or heard. Yeah. I heard about that church down there. I'm not going down there. Church people are just alike. They ain't no good. They're hypocrites. They're too loud. 
There's always some excuse that somebody is making. But when you get hungry enough and thirsty enough, you're going to come and dine at the king's table. When we were in Asia, I don't really like fish because it tastes fishy. <laughs> and it smells fishy. So I don't really like fish. I grew up with fish. My dad fished a lot, and he would catch the fish and bring them home, and we girls would clean the fish. I mean, I am a master fish cleaner. I can scale those fish, slit it down the middle, flip it out, get the guts out, boom. I was my dad's queen fish cleaner. <laughs> so when we were in Asia, guess what they serve in addition to rice? Fish. I don't really like fish. So we had packed our own food. We had packed cans of beans and all of our own American food, and we were excited. Well, I started to feel good, really get a little hungry. <laughs> so the first time we had fish, I didn't touch it. I didn't want any part of it. I mean, they had baked fish, fried fish, barbecue fish, broiled fish, <laughs> any fish with the head still on it. <laughs> and you know what? I didn't want to offend them because that is their custom. And I said, no, I don't want any fish. No, please have some. No, I don't want any fish. And they started really looking. It started smelling good because I was getting hungry. Have some. No, I don't want any fish. And then he said, have some fish. I said, I don't want no deadhead fish. <laughs> <laughs> I still did not eat any fish on that occasion. But the third occasion, we were in Indonesia. They're serving fish again. I, I, by this time, we're, we've been there like 10 days. I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I said, if they serve fish, I will eat fish today. I'm not eating the head. <laughs> And I'm not eating the fins, because you eat the fins too. But when I got hungry, I ate. So those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. When we get fed up and when we've had enough of enough, we will come and dine at the king's table. And sometimes we just eat too much junk food. We have tasted the pleasures of the world, and we love the way it tastes. We love the sex in the city. And many are eating and drinking damnation to their own souls. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way to death. Junk food doesn't even fill you up anyway. It's only temporary, and, and for sugar, it just makes you crave more. And the longer you're out there in the world, the harder it is to let go because the world doesn't let go so easily. Amen. That's where we come in at as servants. We have to go and get them. So how many of you know that only God can satisfy your appetite? Amen. Tell your neighbor, don't eat that. Tell your neighbor, don't eat that. <laughs> so guess who's coming to dinner now? So the servant returns and he tells his master what was said. And the master is furious. He has taken all of this time. Jesus has died on the cross for us. Hung, bled, and died. And we won't even come. So the master is furious, and he tells his servant, go quickly. Go out to get the cripple, the blind, the lame, and the poor. Go into the street and the alleys. That's evangelism. Now, when I think of cripple, I think of those who need help coming to Jesus. They need help coming to Jesus. Those who have been crippled by sin and who are unable to get to Jesus, we have to go and get them. Sinners need help coming to Jesus. They need us to come get them. And then you have the blind. Now, those are the ones who have been trapped in their own world of darkness. They need a guide. You know the saying, the blind can't lead the blind? 
So we have to, we, when we go, we have to be the light. We can't go with, with our testimonies not in check either. We have to speak with authority the word that God has given us, and we have to spit, stick to the word of God, stay away from our own opinions. We have to be the light. We have to be their light, and we must take the light to the lost. Now the deaf, now those are ones who have probably never even heard the good news of the gospel. There is a world of people who have never heard the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have work to do. And then he says, go get the lame. Now those are the ones who are feeble. They're sorry. <laughs> They're unable to walk. Sorry, that's Wikipedia definition, just so you know. But these are the ones who are feeble, weak. They're unable to walk without assistance. So there yet again, we have to go and get them. There might be some inconveniences, and it will probably take us out of our comfort zone because this servant is going. He's talking to people he may have never even thought he would ever talk to, but he's following the master's orders, and he is going. And he is going with a sense of urgency. So then he comes back and he tells the servant, okay, now, I've done everything you told me to do, but there's still room. Amen. Now the master tells him to go out into the roads and to the country lanes. This is the universal invitation. All are invited. Because while the poor, the crippled, and the blind were from the surrounding communities, the host community, to go out into the highways, that's that wide road that many people travel, go out into the highways and the byways and the hedges. Now, the hedges, when I think of hedges, we have a lot of hedges around our house. And, you can, and snakes can kind of hide under the hedges. So those are the ones who are just kind of hiding out, don't want to be seen. Put, cut those hedges down and go and get them. So now this is outside the community. This includes the misfits from across the other side of the track, the outcasts, the prostitutes and the pimps, the alcoholics, the drug addicts and the drug dealers, the liars, the cheaters and the haters, the deviants, those who know they are unworthy. Somebody go get Evelyn Conway. I'm so glad somebody came and got me. Somebody go get Kendrick Conway. Somebody go get Big Maine in them. Go get Big Papa. Go get Baby Daddy. Go get Lil Sister, Bray Bra. Go get all of them. Tell them the table is ready. The table is ready. Tell them the table is ready. And then in verse 23, when the master sends him out, the master says, compel them to come. What does compel mean? Well, one translation was to bully them. I said, well, because God gives us free will. He wants us to be our choice to come. Because if it's my choice, chances are I'm going to hang in there. But if I come because you invited me, I'm just coming because you invited me. But maybe when I get there, some seeds will get into my spirit. So I thought, what does compel mean? So it means to bring something about, to put a little force, to push, to urge. So in other words, be aggressive. Be aggressive. If you're not comfortable with that part of town, I promise you God has somebody in the body who is comfortable in that part of town. But the bottom line is that it is a sense of urgency. Life is short. Hell is hot. Hell is real hot. Life is short. So it's only good news if it arrives in time. So in being aggressive, because I, I was really trying to speak the language of being aggressive and to compel. So I was talking to Pastor. He said, well, in football, it would be called a blitz when you take it up a notch. So in basketball, it would be called a full court press. 
So in hockey, they call it push up, push up. In the club, they call it turn up. <laughs> Just trying to speak the language. <laughs> but for us Christians, it's called fishers of men. Yeah. Go fish. Right. We are to go fish. Yeah. So the challenge today for each of us is to invite everyone we meet to come to the feast. Tell them that the table is ready. Tell them that there's joy at the table. There is love at the table. There is hope at the table. There is peace at the table. Forgiveness is at the table. Second chances. Salvation is at the table. Tell them to come to God's RSVP, God's Redemption Victory Victory Party. Amen. Everything that you can ever need is at the table. And in verse 24, the master says, for none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my dinner party. We have work to do. In psychology, there's something that's called the bystander effect. And the theory goes, the more people around, the less likely we are to intervene and help. Because I'm thinking that it's pastor's job to do this, or it's evangelist Parker's job to do this, or it's the deacon's job to do that. So we stand around and watch things happen. And it started in a case, I want to say it was the early 70s, maybe late 60s. There was a, long, a young lady being brutally stabbed to death somewhere in New York. What's her name? Kitty That's Kitty Genovese. And the people turned a deaf ear. They closed their blinds, they closed their doors, and, she was, and they could hear her screaming. And it's called the bystander effect. We cannot allow this to happen as Christians. We will no longer be bystanders. We will be fishers of men because that is, that is the Great Commission. We have been called to do that. All of us can do that. And it's part of the evangelism that's called invitation. If it's by way of invitation, confrontation, all of the different ones you talked about this morning, we have work to do. And I'll close with this. Matthew 22, 14 says, For many are invited, but few are chosen. I am, now I am delighted and excited to be invited. I have responded to God's RSVP. Have you? Will you? Will you please reply? to the call, to go out to the highways and the byways and the alleys. Watch out for the alley cats because they bite. But go and get them. Go and get them. Jesus went to the cross for all of us. Oh, what love. So for me, I have accepted the invitation to dine at my king's feet. And as soon as my feet strike Zion, I'm going to lay down my heavy burden. And I'm going to put on my robe in glory. And I'm going to shout and tell the story. Because Jesus has welcomed me. All are welcome to dine at the feet. Can y'all sing that song? Jesus will welcome me home.